Before we kick off the show, if you're a fan of History Hack, please do what you can to support the show. We completely get that not everyone is able or willing to dig into their pockets. Times are hard, but by dropping a like, subscribing on Twitter and YouTube, and importantly, leaving a review wherever you get your podcasts, you can help the programme grow and reach more people. If you're interested in becoming a supporter, go to patreon.com forward slash history hack, where you'll find perks from secret Facebook groups to early release material. If you just want to leave us a one-off tip, go to co-fee.com forward slash history hack. The links are in the description. And whatever form your kind support takes, know that we are massively grateful. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I have with me today a, a, a historical great. I have Anne Corsi with me, who's written more than a dozen history books to great acclaim. They include uh, Chanel's Riviera, Husband Hunters, which I love, uh, Margot at War and the Vice, Viceroy's Daughters. Uh, but she's here today to do what she does best, and that's a tale of 20th century strong woman in action. Hello, Anne. Hello, Alexandra. This is brilliant. Um, I, so I've just finished looking through this book. Um, let's start by telling people who is Nancy Kennard and what was her early life like? Um, and I guess her experience of the First World War as well, because the book's going to tell us what she did after. Yes, indeed. Uh, Nancy Kennard was the great granddaughter of the founder of the Kennard shipping line. Her parents could not have been more mismatched. Her father was a fox hunting squire whose hobby was silversmithing, rather quiet, but in his 40s. Her mother was a blonde, bubbly San Francisco heiress, uh, urban to her fingertips. And she really married him because she had been, she wanted to avoid the appearance of being publicly jilted by a Polish prince at whom she had set her cap. Uh, And he made it clear he was interested in another girl. So she was one of those who came across the great army of uh, American girls to marry um, people with British titles. And when she'd had Nancy, her one child, she felt she'd done her duty. So Nancy was actually had a very, very neglected childhood in one way. There was a house full of servants, all that kind of thing, but she never saw her parents. And this really fueled her later resentment of her mother If she'd had brothers and sisters, it might have helped a bit, but she was completely on her own with no one to play with and then put under the regime of an enormously strict governess. Maud, her mother, began to take uh, interest in her when Nancy grew up beautiful and became a debutante, which was in 1914, just before the beginning of the World War I. But Nancy had already... Her character was rather formed because she'd already um, felt this neglect and she really did not like the debutante round. She was had literary interests. She was very intelligent. So was her mother, actually. But her mother was enormously social and Nancy was turned off by the entire social season. That is mad. I do wonder about the plight of this sort of, like you say, an army of American girls with money coming over here to marry into the British aristocracy um, and what life was like for them as well in terms of her mother. I mean, Churchill's mother is another one, isn't she? She sort of ends up shackled to a syphilitic lord. Um, Churchill's mother did have a very good time. Yes, yeah, time. yeah. She made up for it, which is good. Yes. <laughs> I, I liked. I, I would hate to think that they were all completely miserable when they came over, even if, even if they got the short end of the stick in terms of husbands. Um, so, what does Nancy do during the First World War? Uh, basically, entertained, and I mean that in its fullest sense. Mm. Officers home on leave was really. Uh, she had a great friend called Iris Tree, who was the daughter of Sir Bellburn Tree, the actor. And they secretly, because her parents wouldn't approve, rented a studio um, in Fitzroy Street, and it was called the Fitz. And there they would give parties. By this time, they were allowed out together, you know, two girls together. And these parties were, you know, just champagne and boyfriends the whole time. And Nancy then married very young she married somebody to get away from her mother really uh, he mm. was a 
very gallant officer, but he, they, they had no interest in common at all. He was a very good games player. He was a brilliant cricketer. Nancy could not have been less interested in cricket. What she wanted to do was write poetry. She liked the bohemian life. And it only lasted six months. And during it, she fell heavily in love with one of his friends, who she only really knew for a fortnight. And he went back to the war and was killed three weeks before the end of it. And Nancy always felt he was the only man she could ever have lived with. And she got more and more sickened by the social round, more and more again her mother, again what was going on. So we're looking at a huge brand new world after the First World War. Uh, why does she despise, why does she decide to spend the post-war years in Paris? France was very close, and yet it was well away from her mother. Her mother went there twice a year to get clothes. Um, Nancy loved France. The other thing was she could speak French very fluently because immediately after the war, she caught Spanish flu, and she was sent on a long convalescence with one of the women whose finishing school she had been, who was a great friend. And, of course, they talked French. So she was very, very fluent in the language. She also loved Paris. I mean, it's a very romantic, beautiful city. Mm. It hadn't been knocked about much by the war. I mean, there were scars on it because that gun, Big Bertha, came within 50 kilometres. But, you know, whereas the whole of northern France was ravaged, um, forests destroyed, farms destroyed, chemicals in the river, abandoned vehicles, all that kind of thing, ruined, Paris was more or less all right. And also the other thing was that the franc was plunging. So that it was very cheap to live there. And it was close enough for her to nip back across the channel. If she wanted to see her, uh, her um, what do you call them, Soho friends, mm. all the friends, uh, you know, that she'd made in this, the number she'd made before the war ended, she got to know quite a lot of people in the arts world. And that's what she was really interested in, arts and writing. And, of course, Paris was a magnet for that. As well, you said she was uh, into the bohemian lifestyle and that. Is that sort of an epicentre? What's the atmosphere like in Paris? I guess sort of uh, there's an explosion, really, isn't there, of culture? It was an absolute ferment. It was, mm. it was a ferment. It was an explosion. Um, Paris had been the centre of the arts world, for a long time. The great thing about Paris for everybody was it was so free. There was no censorship. Books that was, got chucked in the fire in the United States were published there. Um, you could do what you liked. Uh, homosexuality was not illegal. It hadn't been illegal since the French Revolution, unlike other countries. So that, and um, it was the centre of the arts of pleasure, all the best clothes seemed to come from there. Uh, it was famous for its brothels. Um, one of them even won a prize at an international exhibition for its decor, which is rather unexpected. <laughs> and another one had, while well, Nancy was there, another one had a very famous restaurant uh, that people used to go to. Of course, another draw might well have been that all the waitresses wore were high heels and a camellia in their hair. Yes. <laughs> but, but, you know, anything, it really anything went. And it was also very intensely creative, a ferment of new ideas of people like Picasso painting. Um, Ernest Hemingway wrote his first book there then. Uh, so that it was very vibrant mm. and it had this great cafe life, which other places didn't have in part because the hotels where all these people came, the hotels, you could hardly call them hotels. They were rooming houses, really. Mm. People, the young who got very little money would come over there, they would rent a room and it would have a straw mattress, a cold water sink, possibly a stove, but you had to eat out. So there was a great cafe life. You went out for breakfast, an aperitif, lunch, dinner, and so people met the thronged in cafes. 
I do have to ask, this isn't on a list of questions, but how does her mother react to her going off and in, inserting herself into this? Like, has her mother got different ideas for her future? Her mother wanted her to... Uh, there was this beautiful girl. She thought her uh, Nancy would make probably a very good marriage. Most of her contemporaries married and, as it were, settled down, had children, led the kind of life that they were expected to lead mm. from their social background. Uh, but Nancy didn't. Uh, um, first of all, her mother thought this was rather willful. But Nancy, when she saw her mother, of course, there she was, looking uh, beautiful, well-groomed, um, talking to people. She kind of behaved then. And her mother obviously would like to have seen her. She saw her every time she went over to Paris. And if Nancy came to England, she usually went and had lunch there. You see, her mother was also, she was a brilliant hostess, but she was quite unconventional as one because she had all sorts of people, artists, writers, who um, the top level in society might not necessarily have entertained. I mean, Chips Channon, who lived at the same time, practically everybody who comes to his table is a lord or a lady. Uh, whereas uh, Maud would get, um, she got, Ezra Pound, who was starting life as a poet then, she got all sorts of people like that um, round. And Nancy met quite a lot of them first with her mother, but of course she never gave her mother credit for that. It wasn't in her nature to give her mother credit <laughs> for anything. <laughs> I love, uh, you have said that her life in Paris was sex, art and alcohol, which uh, doesn't sound like a bad life to me. Uh, and the book is largely sculpted around her relationships, isn't it? So shall, yes. you've mentioned him already. Should we start with Ezra Pound? Um, so I, I was going to ask you, how did they meet? So that was through her mother. That was through her mother. He was actually the second of my two relationships. Uh, but it went on for quite a long time because, you see, Ezra Pound was married. Um, not that Nancy ever took that much notice of marriage. It, she didn't see it as an impediment to a love affair. Um, and quite often she rather liked the wives. It depended on the relationship between the husband and wife. Some wives were tolerant, some weren't. Uh, but Ezra Pound, of course, he was also a great womanizer. And he got his chance in the Great War because he didn't have to be, he didn't have to be called up like all the other men. There was a great shortage of men in England in World War I because they were all away fighting. And so the ones that were left, like Ezra, rather had it all their own way. So this was the same for Michael Arlen, who was mm. her first major love affair. I picked out love affairs that I thought, uh, she had countless ones, but I picked out the ones that I thought were probably um, the most interesting in terms of uh, literary impact and how they affected her and others. And, of course, Michael Arlen... Um, became a very famous writer then. Nobody has heard of him much now, but he wrote a yeah. book that was a global bestseller called The Green Hat. And Nancy, Iris Storm, and Nancy was really Iris Storm, or Iris Storm was really Nancy, the heroine. And she, Nancy also appears in others of his book books with a complete description of her, her height, her blondness, um, her beauty, her dislike of her mother, it's all there. And so that's why I included him. And the first winter she was in Paris, the first sort of year she was in Paris, she was with Michael Arlen. You know, they dined, they danced, they used to go to these little boites. Uh, their favourite restaurant was one where at about 10 o'clock all what were called working girls came in, had their meal and went out again. Uh, so she really spent a long time with him, a year, really. What the, and you said you picked out relationships that, for um, <clears throat> their impact as well. So what, what is the impact of the relationship with Michael Arlen? Well, she appeared in the bestseller. Yeah. So that's what I really meant. But in terms of, oh, sorry, I meant in terms of her. Oh, she was very taken up with him. She mm. parted acrimoniously, but she, he was not one of the typical young um, Gardiz she'd met before. He was Armenian. Um, he was very quick-witted. Mm. There was a wonderful occasion after he'd written The Green Hat and he was went to America where he was going to do a lecture tour and be fated. Um, and 
as he came down the gangway of the ship in his astrakhan colored coat, he was grabbed by reporters who said, to what do you attribute your success, Mr. Arlen? And he replied, quick as a flash, per ardua ad astrakhan. <laughs> In terms of the relationship with Ezra Pound, then, what's the impact of that one? Well, that was probably one of the few that she loved more than she was loved. Okay. Uh, Ezra Pound was very keen on her at the beginning, but then um, he had another woman on the go. Also, he was married. So she kept trying to get him to Venice when she was there. And... You know, there was usually a reason he couldn't come. They did spend time together. She wrote him a lot of longing letters. So that really was uh, the impact of that. And also he was he was one of the very well-known people at that time. He was a big figure in England even, although he was an American poet. Big literary figure. So that that, again, I felt had quite an impact on her. There's another novelist as well, isn't there, in the shape of one that everyone will have heard of, um, and that's Aldous Huxley. Absolutely right, yes. Well, she appears in his books too. He became obsessed with Nancy. Uh, he met her um, in the spring, and he had he was married to a very pretty Belgian girl to whom he'd been devoted uh, for some years, who, who he'd met when she was only 16. And he met Nancy, um, I think it was either in the Café Royal or the Eiffel Tower. Eiffel Tower was the restaurant she frequented. And he became, as I say, absolutely obsessed, not so much by her character, but by her looks. Her, She had huge charisma and she was very, very beautiful, of course. You see these enormous eyes ringed with curl. When she kept coming back from Paris, he would meet her. He wanted to follow her to Paris and she wouldn't let him, which is why I include him in this section. And... Um, he he had just landed a very good contract with Chateau and Winders to, for two publications a year, one of which had to be a full-length novel, which had to be in by July. And there they were in, by April. He hadn't written a word because he was hanging about Nancy. Every time she rang, he would rush off to the Eiffel Tower. Uh, he couldn't really take drink. He wasn't a person who drank a lot. He only drank a glass or two and cigarette smoke was frightfully bad for him. He had had an awful eye illness and his sight was very poor. And his wife used to lie awake worrying, would he get knocked over on the way back and all that kind of thing. And she knew all about his passion for Nancy because he used to sit by the telephone waiting. And one night she decided, I've got to just resolve this. And she said to him, tomorrow morning, I'm going to Italy. You can come or not as you wish. And he didn't want to lose his wife, Maria. He said, I'm coming. And they packed feverishly all night. Anything they hadn't packed, they threw out of the window. Then they set off the train station in the morning, caught the train, didn't even stop for breakfast, got to Italy. He was free of Nancy. And in two months, he wrote Antic Hay, which became a very popular book. And he was all right. He'd he'd fled. He'd had to flee the country to get away from his feeling, his obsession with her. That's really interesting. So that's a negative impact in a way, isn't it? Yes. Um, in terms of that one. Yes. How, how did the sort of the rejection uh, impact her? Well, he Nancy really only thought of him as a friend. Yes. That's why she kept him dangling. She wasn't the slightest in love with him. Okay. And uh, she had this very brief affair of about three or four days with him once because he sort of begged for it. And she didn't like it at all. She described being made to love to by Aldous as being crawled over by slugs later to a friend. Oh, no. Not, <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> not that she said that to him, but she was always very fond of him. And she thought of him as a friend. And, you know, if a friend goes abroad, you don't have high strikes. <laughs> oh, the poor guy. I don't know, that in a way, like, she's taking one for the team as she sees it. Um, yes. Oh, no. Um, <laughs> There's lots of interspersing themes coming uh, throughout the book and that. Um, Talk to us about surrealism, that movement, and how that comes into the story. 
Well, that really sprang out of Dadaism. Nancy met someone called Tristram Zara, who was a moving spirit in Dadaism, which is basically, if you really want to sum it up, nonsense. Um, I mean, Dadaists would get on the stage, they would each have cuttings from different newspapers, they'd read them all out at once, that sort of thing. And the performances usually ended in a bit of a riot. The French in those days blew whistles to signify disapproval. And so there was blowing of whistles and showers of eggs and tomatoes because they were pretty vocal at expressing themselves. And she had a brief affair with Zara, Tristan Zara, and surrealism, Dadaism began to break up and it really moved towards surrealism. And that was started, uh, there were three people who started it, André Le Breton, and another one was Louis Aragon. I can't remember the third, but they started surrealism. And surrealism was really, there was a great revolt against uh, what had gone before. Um, logic, reason. It was, they said it was reason and logic that had taken us into the war. Therefore, we ban reason and logic um, against mechanism, against, and surrealism was really the expression of, I suppose, of thought and I suppose emotion, but without the breaks of reason. So you could really say, or and they believed a lot in uh, thoughts and what you felt and everything rising from the subconscious. I mean, you know, Louis, Lewis Carroll, Hunting of the Snark, that was years and years before, but they claimed him as a surrealist because it is such a surrealist poem. And later, you know, there were painters in it like Salvador Dali who painted these limp watches over trees, that sort of thing. It was what emerged in a way from your subconscious. I think they went in for automatic writing as well, but they were terribly serious about it. They used to meet every single day in a cafe, this hardcore of surrealists. Um, and they also rather believed in a bit of violence. Um, they thought there would probably be some kind of violent revolution. They veered towards communism. They were all linked, these things, you see. And Nancy got embroiled in it, really, through uh, one of her lovers. Who we're going to talk about now, because you can't move to France uh, with a, a flaky con uh, concept of uh, marital vows and not have an affair with a Frenchman, can you? Um, you've You're already absolutely right there. Yeah. <laughs> you've already mentioned him, haven't you? So Louis Aragon. Yes, they must have seen each other about uh, in the cafes because, you know, you did see everybody. But they only met when um, she was with an English lover who knew him. And he came over and I think they sh shared a taxi back. Very good looking, uh, Louis Aragon. Um, very charming, very clever. He was actually a frightfully good poet, I think. And... They, they met one evening and they dropped her English lover off first, uns, this unsuspecting chap, poor man. And in the taxi, Nancy turned round and put her hand on his, uh, his knee, um, to be polite about it. And the, their affair started there and then. And mm. they fell passionately in love with each other. They were absolutely obsessed with each other for about a couple of years. And she adored him. She was quite, she was very conscious that she was difficult. Um, it was rather like the scorpion who can't help stinging because it's a scorpion's nature. She would usually somehow manage to destroy an affair. Why, I don't know. I think it was, I don't know what it was. That. She seems to buck at any kind of control, doesn't she? Probably. Yes, I think that may be it. Her mother, but yeah. Yes, but anyway, they were obsessed. For Now, what, what usually did these affairs in is she had no idea of fidelity. Uh, to her, if she fancied, happened to fancy somebody else while she was in a relationship with one person, she'd go off and sleep with them. Mm. And, of course, there's very few people who like that or tolerate it. And it devastated Aragon. This happened in Venice. And it completely devastated him. Because this, the um, Surrealists' code, really, was that... <clears throat> the Surrealists' code was that what you really wanted was the one woman to whom you, whom you adored and could be faithful to. 
I mean, till you found her, they were quite happy looking around <laughs> and giving plings with others. But once you found this person, that was supposed to be it. And Aragon was actually quite naturally a faithful person. He thought he'd found it in Nancy, you see. And that's why he was so devastated when he realised he hadn't. He took years to break free of her. Does she have an impact on his art? He wrote a wonderful poem to her when they broke up, finally, called Let's Spit on Love. It's very heartfelt. And she had an impact in a sense that um, he started to... in he started to burn the novel he'd been writing for years. The Surrealists didn't approve of novels. And Nancy managed to rescue quite a lot of it. So uh, pulled the pages out of the fire. So you could say in that way, she, yes, she did. And he wrote a book uh, that became very famous um, in the literary Paris of those times, a short book that was triggered by his affair with Nancy. Does the crash of 1929 impact Paris and Nancy personally? The crash of 1929 in France was a little bit delayed because mm-hmm. so many of the French had sort of reserves of gold, sometimes, you know, gold coins under the bed. But it didn't really start affecting Paris till about 31, 32. It affected the Americans in Paris. I should have told you that there were a huge number of Americans in Paris because it's a very important part of uh, the Paris scene then. They started coming over after World War I. Mm. Some of them had seen Paris when they were ambulance drivers and everything and been fascinated by it. They then went back to America and they, the young people in America had the same feelings as uh, the young people on the continent. They wanted new things. They wanted this art, they wanted to be able to write what they wanted, all that. But they went back to an America that had got actually much more Puritan. First of all, there was Prohibition, um, which came into force in 1920. And there was also, there was a kind of red scare. The labor unions were uh, starting up and the uh, mass of Americans, I think, were rather frightened that there might be some kind of a revolution. So they said, status quo or status quo ante, let's go right back to that. And so things got rather more rigid, but um, prohibition was a tremendous factor in their coming over to America because prohibition started bootlegging. It sort of glamorized alcohol rather for the young because it was illegal. You couldn't buy, sell or distribute alcohol. If you happened to have an enormous cellar, you could drink it but you couldn't do anything else. And of course, there was in all sorts of illegal alcohol, um, uh, moonshine, whiskey, bootleg, gin, which usually tasted absolutely filthy. And so that's why cocktails became so popular, to disguise the taste. Well, that's the Long Island iced tea is a prohibition cocktail, isn't it? Because it it just looks Mm non-alcoholic. Yes. And it literally, you could get everything in it, which is why it's just such a a mess in terms of the, the... what the alcohol is in it and what it tastes of. Yes, yes. <laughs> um, anyway, they came flooding over to Paris, where, of course, prohibition was unknown. and They could drink to their heart's content. Uh, the waiter at a restaurant of one of Nancy's friends was so mystified by the idea of prohibition, he asked if it was a new religion. And a lot of the Americans who came over, I really drank an awful lot. They would go and work on one of the two Paris papers to, for a pitifully small salary, but on the other hand, they could live incredibly cheaply with the franc, which was sliding down and down and down until about 1925. And they could drink to their heart's contents, and a lot of them did. So we have to ask, there's even by Nancy's standards, there's one love affair that raises eyebrows, isn't there? His name was Henry Crowder. Why is he controversial? Well, in those days, uh, Henry Crowder was a member of a black jazz band she met in Venice. Uh, She more or less picked him up. Um, He was asked, she was dancing uh, with her cousin at this Adele. 
uh, they went out to dance and it was a it was a brilliant jazz band you see in paris there was really no color bar hardly at all because when the american army came over after world war uh, for during world war 1 at the end of the war some of the the black contingent was kept completely separate in the american army and not allowed to go to restaurants i mean really kept under like they did in america whereas those who were seconded to the french army were treated just like french soldiers and of course they took the story back to them that you know there we were we went to restaurants we did everything that the french soldiers did uh, paris is wonderful and a lot of them particularly the ones from uh, new orleans were brilliant musicians and they thought we'll take our band over and so black jazz bands became incredibly popular in paris and then josephine baker came over and absolutely swept the ball people thought she was simply wonderful so that it was very easy there was no real color bar in paris in venice it was strange to have this very blonde woman uh, with a black man um and i mean it was very unusual in those days so very few black people around in england there were notices in boarding houses sometimes saying no blacks irish or dogs that was the kind of thing mm. and anyway nancy rather fell for him and they became a team he was her longest love affair and really the one that she found most formative she said after it was all over henry made me and she took up the cause of black people then she really campaigned for them and there was a lot to take up not so much in england where when she took henry over all her friends welcomed him warmly according to his diary it was i mean the young were perfectly all right but people of her mother's generation who hadn't really seen this and thought, what is my daughter doing with a black man um were horrified he was a very nice man and as I say, he was welcomed warmly on the ship and by her friends. And eventually he he too got tremendously tired of her infidelities. She was always going off with other people. He kept saying, I'm going back to America, and she would lure him back. Or he went over there and things perhaps didn't go well. And she would say, how are you? Shall I send you some money? And he would come back again. And he was a huge help to her when she started her printing press. She wanted to publish uh, little-known poets. And in fact, she was the first person to publish Samuel Beckett. I mean, she really worked at it. She learned printing properly, and Henry helped her. I, so I, I love the impact of that one. Um, I don't want to tell people what the end of the book is um, and how her sort of the story of this book finishes, because I want them to go and buy the book. But <laughs> I think we do need to mention there is another man in her life that we haven't talked about, but this isn't about sex, is it? No. She also had the fifth uh, word in my title is friendship. Mm. And her great friend was a man called George Moore. He had been her mother's lover. And he first met Nancy. She was four when she first met him. She called him her first friend. And he was absolutely sweet to her. He took a great interest in this little girl. He realised she was neglected. He would go out for walks with her or with her and her governess. If he was with Nancy, they would do things like picking wildflowers and he would tell her the names of different birds. He was good at recognising birdsong. And... Uh, if he was with the governess, he would discuss French and English literature with her, which got her in a good temper. And so he really took an interest in Nancy. And he did all his life. She regarded him as a sort of father figure. Mm. Um, he was a very well-known writer then and had made a lot of money from his books. And every time she was in England, she would go and have dinner with him. He would go over to Paris to see her. They would walk around. He would perhaps stay at her flat when she got a flat, uh, but they would see a lot of each other. Um, and he was a major figure in her life. I really like that. I really like that. Because uh, one thing I would, uh, we've talked about her love affairs and that's what the book is um, based around, but there's so much more than to her than 
painting her up as like a raging nymphomaniac with loads oh, of absolutely of yes i mean she had <clears throat> she made a huge impact on everyone who met her or saw her i mean one woman said you could not be in the same room as nancy and not be aware of her and after she died all her friends got together and they wrote this um compendium about her i mean she was awful in a lot of ways, but she was also wonderful in a lot of others. And she was a very, very good friend. She would always support her friends. Her two women friends, her best women friends from Paris, they were friends for 40 years. I mean, it, it really went on. And it was just, you know, it was, she had these character flaws in a major, major way, but she also had wonderful uh, qualities. I think you've done an absolutely wonderful job of um, talking about a very interesting woman. Um, and we're all about women's history on History Hack. And I love as well that she just she doesn't do rules. There are no rules in Nancy's world, uh, which, like you say, sometimes could make you an awful person. But as well, uh, I, she's she's a great character in that sort of post World War One Europe. I think of she of- did try to help other people enormously with certainly what she did her campaigning for black people was tremendous and thank you so much the book five love affairs and a friendship is out now you can get it on the history hack bookshop uh, all of your other book retailers that are small independent bookshops because we don't do amazon here on history hack jeff bezos does not need any more money for rocket fuel uh, do buy the book it's wonderful and thank you so much thank you when our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book The 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great 